Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In this episode of Exploration Science, co-founder and CEO of NUMA firm, Dr. Christian Schwartz, and peptide manufacturing expert, Dr. Alain Scarso, discuss the peptide therapeutics market and bringing biochemistry to peptide production. Um, first off, thank you for taking the time to, to come and be on Exploration Science. Um, I'm very excited to have Numa Firm here. And uh, maybe, Elaine, could you introduce yourself and give a little bit of your background and then we'll, we'll uh, jump into Christian? Yeah, thank you. First of all, uh, just one, one comment. Nice career you've had there. <laughs> you know, all these. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so we're talking as well to a peptide chemist, which is really fantastic. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, well, um, actually, I'm a senior consultant uh, in this, what I call the peptide industry, uh, since I am retired for, uh, from, from 2016 already. And I have the long career as a uh, CDMO uh, player in the, in the field of uh, therapeutic peptide manufacturing. Um, so was, I was uh, really with uh, different companies uh, as general management of these companies. Uh, like uh, the first one was the uh, UCB in Belgium, UCB Pharma. Uh, then the second one uh, was Lonza because we were acquired by Lonza uh, as a, a peptide business, actually. And after that, I moved to uh, Polypeptide, uh, where I was managing director of the uh, Scandinavian operations. And then thereafter, uh, the director of the global operations there for the Polypeptide group. Uh, so in all that career, indeed, it's a, all the, a bath of peptides actually <laughs> that I was into, uh, and um, I like to help people that I would like that would like indeed to either develop new technologies, develop their business as well in in the area. And I'm also part of the board of uh, or director of of a company called uh, Send Chemicals in Switzerland. Uh, which is indeed also in the peptide uh, arena. Excellent, thank you. All right, and then Christian, um, can you give also sort of your background? Yeah, thank you. Um, very impressive careers indeed. Um, so uh, I, I, I cannot uh, refer to so many great um, companies where I worked at. Um, I started my career as you also did at the university, of course. Um, um, doing my PhD those times, and during this time, I I found uh, or I developed kind of the initial technologies we are using nowadays to do what we will discuss later on. So I got a PhD in biochemistry, and after that, I decided to commercialize or try to commercialize the technologies I um, mentioned. Um, I did that for a couple of years in an academic in academia environment, um, applied for grants, built a team. Before we moved out in 2017 out of the university as company called Numa Firm, with a team of six people those days being financed um, by a VC capital, venture capital. And um, so I learned after my PhD, which happened in 2012 already nowadays, almost 10 years, um, how to handle the technology and how to adjust it to the market demands. And um, somehow, we started our company in the field of peptides because we saw that chemical synthesis, which nowadays is supplied um, yeah, almost all of the time, has strengths but also limitations, and we wanted to solve these limitations. Um, so we, we started to become a peptide process development company. And um, yeah, nowadays we also um, work on the field of peptides. We will have also a few words about what peptides are most likely and also on proteins um, but let's keep more with peptides today so we we were a peptide company and i got familiar with um, all these things that are related regulatory wise and production wise um, so that that's more my background um, since we are a company um, since 2017 i'm a managing director at, at this company that's about myself impressive as well. I mean, I think, you know, learning uh, about people like you who've gone from academia to starting a company, it's, it, that's a big leap, right? It's, it's forging your own path. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, you'd mentioned um, limitations about the manufacturing process um, of peptides. Is that sort of what 
pushed you to to start new reform or what was the what was the the reason the guiding force so initially um me personally i i was always thinking about doing something self-employed um so i like to you know um fulfill my dreams do whatever i like and i want to to move things and not just work for working and earn money so um of course when you you get educated at the university i mean what can you do what kind of self-employment ship can you work on you need to have some technology in your hands or an idea and by luck at the end this technology fall into my hand during my phd time and after seeing good initial results with technology um I, it was very clear for me to try to start something out of this technology um as an entrepreneur so um the focus on peptides or whatever we do now came then uh, alongside yeah so we needed to to think about um, our business model, uh, what are the markets we are targeting. And so it came step by step out that peptides might be a good starting point. Um, but at the beginning, of course, this, um, this was all that happened. The beginning was just to, to use the technology and um, yeah, get an entrepreneur. So can we talk a little bit about that, the peptide market, sort of why you chose to go there and what, what that, that market landscape looks like? And Elaine, definitely, please jump into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if I may say something there, Christian. Uh, it's just that uh, when we met together with the NUMA firm, uh, it's also already in 2017, uh, the start, uh, we were looking indeed at uh, what type of complementarity uh, this company would bring in, in this peptide business world, I would say. And uh, uh, very soon we saw that uh, there is a, a quite a substantial number of projects uh, that uh, either that were commercial or, or really in clinical development that we're still using natural uh, peptide, I would say, without uh, the need of really uh, having uh, only the chemical manufacturing in, in hand. Uh, the issue was that indeed uh, that market is crowded, of course, with the CDMOs that are really quite a, numbers, number, a num, quite a number of players. And it's very difficult from the start to really impose right, a, 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 a technology like the one of Numa Firm for developing uh, you know, peptide drugs at, at the early stage, for instance. So uh, the question was indeed, uh, wh what kind of uh, approach could we have uh, together with uh, Numa Firm? And the analysis of the market went so good that, you know, indeed, uh, there is quite a substantial part of uh, nature of peptides you know, uh, that are in, in the portfolio. Uh, that being said, uh, it, it, as I said earlier, it's complementary to uh, what the other techniques are, are offering. And so uh, the issue there is to look at what type of really uh, natural compound from the start uh, we could really um, do a manufacture with the technology. Uh, not forgetting that uh, also there are modifications that are post uh, you know, manufacturing, of course, which uh, allows indeed the, the technology to approach other products. And the ones that we all know to nowadays, for instance, are uh, products like uh, GLP analogs that are modified and all these kind of things are models uh, for uh, a, a company like my firm uh, to, to analyze. Right. And so um, I guess a couple of questions there. What, what's the current number of peptide therapeutics on the market today? The current number of? Peptide therapeutics that are on the market. Ooh, uh, it's, more than, uh, it's more than 60 uh, peptide drugs, really counting on those that are really having substantial sales, of course, mm -hmm. without the generics. Sure. With all, with all the, uh, the genetic peptide, of course, uh, which is much more difficult to analyze because these uh, are a confidential number from the generic companies, mm -hmm. as you know. Uh, but the, uh, the fact is that, yes, the, the, the number of commercial drugs is increasing, of course, and the trend is, is indeed to have uh, what is of interest nowadays, longer and longer sequences uh, of peptide that are really uh, uh, approached in, in during clinical development. 
take, take for example, vaccines, for instance, that are actually uh, using quite large uh, sequences, or, or even in cancer therapies, there are really uh, longer peptide sequences uh, due to the approach of immunotherapeutic uh, you know, uh, drugs that cause for longer sequences as well. And I see that always in light of what Luma Firm is offering. That's all what I'm saying. You know, all the other drugs uh, that are either shorter sequences or modified are really uh, more and more present as well. Uh, but that's another, as I said, it's complementary. It's another part of the business where shorter peptide and highly modified peptide, complex one, uh, are in the in the in the hands of uh, CDMOs player with, with the chemistry. Mm -hmm. So, Christian, that kind of leads into what you were mentioning before about where NumaFirm, um, where that technology kind of fits in with the, the peptine space. Can you define what a peptine is and then sort of talk a little bit about really what NumaFirm does as a company? And then we can kind of get into the, the technology that you develop. Yeah, sure. So, um, Alain was talking about peptides a lot. And actually, if you have a look on the landscape and the market, Peptides are not really long molecules containing more than 30 to 40 amino acids. Uh, Allah also mentions the GLP-1 analogons, and these are fairly the longest ones. There are a few exemptions, of course, yeah, but there's a natural limit somehow at 30 to 40 amino acids. And actually, the FDA also has a nomenclature of peptides being molecules up to 40 amino acids being to this length range, small molecules. And everything beyond that are biologics. So um, most of the time they're called proteins with totally different regulatory pathways. And um, so w when we, me personally, I'm a biochemist and a lot of, of our team, um, they are also biochemists, biologic stuff like that. And um, we typically used to work with proteins and what we knew from those times, proteins are not containing of 41 or 45 or 56 amino acids. Typically, they contain 200, 300, or much more amino acids. So obviously, there seems to be a kind of gap between proteins and the nomenclature of peptides. Um, and this gap is um, roughly in the range of 30, 40 amino acids up to 200, 300 amino acids. And these are exactly the molecules we call peptides. Because these peptides, they are first underrepresented on the market, and we believe they are secondly underrepresented because it's so tough to be to be manufactured because chemical synthesis gets limited by the manufacturing of such long chain peptides. And also, if you use recombinant approaches, you will find out that they are also very challenged. If we approached um, big pharma or biotechs five to ten years ago and said, you know, we want to to produce peptides with a recombinant system, they said we tried that several times. We don't do that anymore. We use chemical synthesis, despite the disadvantages of being expensive, not sustainable, not scalable. But for a pharma se segment, of course, you don't need huge amounts, so scalability is, you know, somehow okay. Uh, but there are still disadvantages. Nevertheless, uh, all the people have chosen chemical synthesis because recon and means are so tough for such small proteins. Um, we make a difference with our technology, so. We started our company with peptides, as I mentioned, and we have peptides projects running, actually projects with, for very short peptides, um, a few amino acids only, but then in the non-pharma environment. You ask for markets. We keep on pharma market right now, right? That's where peptides are at home, I would say. They are only recognized really in pharma, in brackets. We, when we started NumaFam, wanted to make a difference here by reducing cost of goods, increasing scale, and then enabling our clients to go to non-farm applications. But as I mentioned, only in brackets for now. So um, we we um, we started our company as peptide company mm, with our approach. It's all about our approach because it is very very allergent to produce peptides and nowadays also peptides and proteins in terms of purity of the material development speed, cost of goods, scalability. So there are a lot of USPs. And since we have this technology, our business model is that we get a peptide or a peptide in nowadays also protein sequences from our clients. So they just give us amino acid composition. And that's sufficient then for us to train our system and develop a production process. So the outcome of working with us is at the end the production process, the cell line, SOPs, things like that. And that's where we get our money for in the fee for service model. That's what we're doing. We believe we develop the best on the market production processes 
for peptides, peptines, and proteins. And can you dive in a little deeper to that, that technology um, of what Numafirm employs? So, um, as I mentioned before, the majority of peptides is for sure being produced by chemical synthesis, whereas proteins um, are produced by recombinant technology. So you, you train cells, the cells produce the target, and you somehow extract the target outside of the um, cellular environment, let's call that by that. Um, the advantages of the chemical synthesis is are they, it's a very reliable approach, it's a quick approach, um, so it's good. Disadvantages are scalability, of cost of goods, and maybe sustainability. So um, there are disadvantages. The disadvantages of recombinant means, for sure, are that um, you have to deal with a lot of process-related impurities, because if we work with cells, you know, somehow to need to purify your target outside of the cells, and overall, for peptides and peptines, it's regarded as relatively inefficient and, and slow. Um, so we don't use recombinant approaches nowadays anymore. We don't use chemical synthesis. We use something that we call a biochemical approach. And this approach is called NUMA switch. What we do here is in the first step, we use organisms, E. coli organisms, to produce a raw material. Yeah, it's a raw material that is highly efficiently produced um, by, by these cell lines. Um, but in an, in an, an in a state where the targets are non-functional. So, and then we collect them out of that. And then we've developed a trick how we can switch on these non-functional aggregated targets very, very efficiently to the functional stage in high purity grades. Um, this, it's, it's a, it's a process step that happens in the mid and downstreaming part of a process. And here, as I mentioned, we switch on the target with, with, with our technology called Numa Switch. It's a fusion protein that we fuse to the target. And we can yeah, really switch this fusion protein on. And by switching it on by the addition of ions, um, it, it gets soluble and functional. And this holds also then true to the fused target. So it was a little bit confusing. To, to come to the point, we use a biochemical tool instead of chemical synthesis or recombinant technologies. So, yeah. And very specifically, the, the proteins, when you, they're sec, um, secreted from E. coli, it's into an inclusion body, right? That's where they're, can you like maybe dive into that? that so the, the issues with inclusion bodies and all of the, the steps there. Absolutely. So um, now we're jumping in a little bit more technically into recombinant um, um, approaches that are available. And, um, some people might not be so familiar with that, especially the people being chemists typically are used to chemical synthesis. So I try to give you a minor overview of what's possible at the moment and uh, how it works and what are advantages and disadvantages. So if you use cells to produce something, you have more or less three options to produce targets. You can train the cells to transport targets outside of the cell. This is called transport system. You can use the cells to produce targets inside of the cell, so in the so-called cytoplasm, so inside the cells. Or um, you can use something that are called inclusion bodies, aggregated cell aggregates. Um, each of the system has advantages and disadvantages. Um, since we are using inclusion bodies, I only briefly explain you the advantages and disadvantages of the alternatives, and then I jump more detailed onto inclusion bodies. So what are the two different options? Transport systems and cytoplasmic production. If you transport targets outside of the cell with a transport system, it's simply not possible for many targets. It's simply not efficient for many targets and um, so not planable. Um, and at the end, the titers might be really low. For the peptide industry, we learned it's not acceptable at all because it takes too long to develop for clinical phase developments. So what we see is on the market for preclinical studies and phase one studies, um, people always go to chemical synthesis and big pharma who has po a competency in recombinant technologies. Yeah. For example, GLP-1 analogs, they are produced by recombinant means. Yeah. But the initial studies are done with chemical synthesis material. And if our clients have the competency to work with bioprocesses, so recombinant technologies, they try to develop them in parable. And if it's working efficiently, then they switch ones. But that's only true for big pharma because, you know, they have all this technology know-how in-house 
And for biotech, it's not the case. So meaning if you use a transport system, it's too slow to go to preclinical and phase one studies. The same actually holds true with the cytoplasmic expression. So if you produce your target inside the cells, it's also slow because you need to handle degradation um, inside the cell. You need to purify a target um, from all the cell host proteins and DNA. It's a very complex, inefficient, and also timely um, uh, way to produce your target. So cytoplasmic expression and transport systems are not an option for peptide production at all. Otherwise, you would see more such uh, strategies for these kind of peptides, but it's not the case. They are produced by chemical synthesis. Now, the third option are inclusion bodies, as I mentioned, aggregated proteins that are built during the production inside the cell. Why are they built? Because the cells produce so much target that these targets don't have time to fold properly, uh, properly. So they interact intermolecularly by hydrophobic or ionic interactions. And if you have interaction between two targets, this means they aggregate, right? And at the end precipitate. So these are these aggregated inclusion bodies. They are non-functional. They are not properly formed, right? So, and um, nevertheless, they have advantages like being produced at high titers, as I mentioned, because that's the reason that they are formed, right? High titers, if you take them out, they are quite pure already because you can spin them down and all the impurities keep in the soluble fraction. Uh, so they are quite pure already. But the big problem is with these inclusion bodies that um, how do you generate the functional form of that? So it's aggregated. And to do that, you have to perform a step called refolding. So you need to refold them from an aggregated, let's call it unfolded form to a functional form. And this refolding step is very, very tricky. Because if you have these unfolded proteins, yeah, you take them out of the cells, you have them in a the vial, let's call it a vial, and then you need to convert them to functional, to the functional form. Then you observe the same then in the cell. You observe aggregation and precipitation due to the interaction of these molecules. And by, because of that, you lose the majority of your material. So if you get 10% yield, this is already good. So this means you lose more than 90%, right? So uh, despite being expressed at high titers, these inclusion bodies, you don't get your hands on efficiently. That's the problem with the inclusion bodies. Um, with our approach now, we call it Numa switch. We use inclusion bodies because the titers are better than with transport system, with cytoplasmic expression, the purity is better. One advantage we observed in the last couple of years is also that you can produce cytotoxic material because you don't have an active target inside the cell. So we said, let's try to get our hands on inclusion body material by our approach. And what were we doing? So we take the inclusion bodies and they are fused to our switch tech proteins. So by rational, we produce in the first step these aggregated proteins. But then we take them out. As I mentioned, they are unfolded and they tend to aggregate. And when we have them, we add ions that bind to the switch tech proteins. So these switch tech proteins contain more precisely calcium ion binding domains, and we add calcium ions. And these calcium ions bind to the switch check proteins, and this binding event converts these unfolded switch check proteins to highly soluble, stable proteins very, very efficiently. So they get soluble and functional. And what we learned is after this happened, the fused targets, where the peptides, peptines, or also proteins, they keep in solution and don't aggregate due to the presence of the switch check proteins. And since they keep in solution and they don't aggregate and precipitate, then they have the time to find the proper fold. So even for proteins and peptides, by being fused to the switch tech, they are refolded efficiently in a functional form. And by doing so, we now de um, solve the major limitation of inclusion bodies, namely the inefficient refolding. With our approach, we can take the advantages of, advantages of inclusion bodies and refold them efficient, efficiently up to quantitatively. And this makes a difference. So it's a biochemical tool because the refolding step is triggered by calcium ions in a kind of vial, yeah, in a vessel. So it's a biochemical reaction. And by doing it in a vial and not inside the cellular context, we can adjust the refolding conditions in terms of ions, pH values, buffer composition, meeting the target demands. Yeah. So we can, we can, we can develop processes that are acceptable for targets. Yeah, and that's a big difference. It's a biochemical tool, um, and that's the NUMA switch approach.
Excellent. Yeah. So then I guess the question is, so now you've got this, this pneuma switch tag on your protein. And so then that's not going to be your drug molecule. So how do you get rid of it? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, and, and I have to say, Numa firm is operating since 2017. But as I mentioned, my PhD, my PhD time was over in 2012. And since then, uh, I was thinking about all these things. Yeah. Uh, how to optimize refolding, uh, do we work on proteins or peptides, uh, and how do we separate the switch check proteins from the target? This was your question. So it was a long, long time we needed to develop all the answers. And um, the switch, NUMA switch technology is operating now since five to seven years very efficiently, but only since two to three years, we solved the limitation you were referring to. How do we get rid of the switch check protein? Because we also learned in the last years that our clients being peptide, peptide people, they don't accept any residual amino acids on the target. This is different to the protein world. So we, we are biochemists, you know, we, we try to use those days recombinant technologies. Uh, and if when there's an amino acid keeping attached to your target that is not, you know, desired, who cares? Because it's not different. It's not possible in another way, right? In the protein field, in the recombinant field, you just need to accept this, but not for peptides. Our client said, no, uh, um, we, we, we did some jokes with them. We said, you know, we have your peptide containing 30 amino acids and the um, 31s and 32nd amino acids is for free from us. <laughs> yeah, so we said, you can have it for free. So they said, of course, no, we don't want to have that for free. We want to have the target exactly as we asked for. And so we um, work with fusion proteins, the switch tech protein in our case, and separating that from fused targets, as I mentioned, is not trivial. There's no platform available on the market that you can always use to separate your targets natively without keeping amino acids attached. And we learned that really hardly in the last decade. Um, we always, what we, we typically, I will come to the solution, Wendy. I just <laughs> make an introduction. So we, we tended to, to have a look on the target, and then we thought, okay, how can we separate it natively from the from molecules? We always de develop a kind of specific process for each target. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it worked not so good, sometimes it didn't work. Because if you use proteases to cleave your target off, they may harm the target, they may not work efficiently. So there are really question marks that you cannot answer because you, before you have tried. And this, of course, again, takes time and doesn't make our clients happy. So we really needed to, to develop a platform that works always independently of the target. And we worked a lot on that in the last six to seven years. And we have developed this protease platform. So when we do the refolding step nowadays, as I mentioned, we have a switch tag being fused to the target. We insert a specific amino acid sequence containing six amino acids. And these six amino acids nowadays are recognized by a very, very specific protease. We call that NumaCut protease. Um, and this protease is the first on the market that accepts these six amino acids and cleaves to the C-terminal end of the six amino acids, releasing the target exactly as you ask for it with the native N-terminus. All the proteases that are available on the market cannot do it that this how we do it, because we have worked a lot on the NumaCut protease. We have based it on a sequence specific proteases that exists on the market, but which didn't do the job. And we have worked here with enzyme optimization companies. One company is called Evo Enzyme. In Spain, for example, they apply machine learning and AI to optimize enzymes. We have worked with a part of the Technical University uh, of Munich to do directed evolution and rational design. So at the end, state of the art technology you know to optimize enzymatic activities so we have applied that with our partners and we came up with a solution with the numa cut and after we have developed it two to three years ago uh, ago now we are in the situation that we can refold the targets being fused as a switch check and always throw on the numa cut protease releasing the native target this was a big step for us uh, and only since we have this numa cut protease as i mentioned two to three years ago since then, we had really the platform in our hand that allows the service offering we are doing nowadays being quick, as quick as chemical synthesis. This was actually due to the NumaCut, otherwise it wouldn't have worked out. So um, a couple of questions. One is uh, maybe we didn't really talk about 
what, what you just mentioned, the, the service that NEMA firm provides. So just maybe talk about that. And then um, for, for both you and Elaine, I'd love to know um, more about just the comparison between that protein world where you can have those related forms and what those look like versus the, the, pepti the peptide world. And then sort of what the advantages are again of using the inclusion bodies on all these side reactions, side reactions that happen in cells. So um, let's, Allah, do you have anything to add um, or shall I continue? Uh, I'm, I'm fine when you want to say something. It's fine, it depends very, very much where we want to go now. But if I understand from Wendy, uh, we just have now to look at um, uh, those bracket uh, differences uh, between, between the, two, uh, the two type of approach, of course, uh, and where they are converging. Uh, as you rightly say earlier, Christian, uh, the need for uh, matching uh, with the exact uh, purity and sequences and uh, characteristics and physical chemical characteristics of the uh, targeted peptide is, is mandatory. It's, a, it's, a, it's obvious. And the, uh, the FDA uh, and the MEA went to, to look at closer uh, what uh, would be this uh, hybrid world between the, uh, the chemical and the biotech world for the peptide, of course. And then uh, they are very much well educated nowadays, of course, and they look at uh, what, what uh, is needed really, uh, and they impose uh, rules nowadays. So um, this is where you rightly say that you have reached a point where you now can match uh, with the technology, with the, uh, the, the your Numafarm technology, match these purity needs and, and of course, uh, characteristic needs uh, as well. Uh, so that is, sorry to tell it that way, but it's done for you. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but it's not yet done in terms of real uh, overall uh, uh, overall commercial business, I understand it. But it's, uh, it's proven. Uh, so that's a good point. Uh, um, where where do we stand? Uh, you know, as as a player, as a player in in the field, of course, and was always frustrated when people were coming for looking at uh, products like cytokines or you know insulin analogs and all these things, and no way to respond to that in terms of CDMO, of course. And then you opening this uh, potential for. Of course, for uh, the, the, this manufacturing world, but also for the clients, because they are now in, uh, understanding that these longer polypeptides or peptides, could, 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 could you say, uh, are affordable uh, in a sense that you can, uh, like the chemists uh, are doing, you can match with the timing that is needed for developing a drug as well. Uh, as a candidate in clinical trial, for instance. And of course, uh, later on, hopefully, you're, you'll be uh, providing uh, commercial needs as well. But it's, uh, I'm not sure I, I answered you what you, you, your comment was, Wendy. Yeah, sure. I think part of it was just for the, for the listeners to understand what is the difference, because Christian had mentioned with proteins, there's uh, some leeway on having extra amino acids or oxidations. Mm -hmm. Um, and and just how that what that looks like the difference between a protein and a peptide of what's acceptable. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit. Uh, I would say uh, I'm not really uh, knowledgeable in in all the proteins that have been uh, produced so far as commercial drugs and and, and, and clinical development. But uh, that being said, uh, I'm not sure that there is a such a Leeway, I would say, to, to, to uh, look at closer the the, the, the protein structure. Uh, nowadays, as well, in the biological manufacturing, there is a uh, the same that is going on with with the peptide as well. Uh, the purity and the and the chemical characteristics of, of the uh, proteins are, you know, mandatorily. Uh, well uh, established and well uh, documented to the FDA and the EMA, for instance, to take them, those two. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, there is, I would, I would say that there is no difference, uh, Christian, I would say that there is no difference between the two in terms of need and, and demand. 
uh, but that that's for sure that uh, you know insulin analog, for instance, are uh, many proteins that are actually uh, probably affordable to be done through these these techniques of, of biological uh, manufacturing or biochemical manufacturing as well. Uh, but it's the same that for peptide. The, 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 the characteristic and the, the documentation that you need for manufacturing those uh, are really high and, and with a high demand, uh, regulatory demand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So then maybe we can go back to sort of where what NumaFirm actually um, offers. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are a service company um, that, as I mentioned before, are process developing processes, and we um, do that up to a scale of 100 gram material at the moment in house. Um, so people can get 100 gram non GMP material um, under ISO certificates. Um, good for talks and animal trials. That's what we do. So we develop the process and supply material up to 100 gram. Um, and we do here this for a fee for service um, in a fee for service model. So we get paid for different development programs. The first development program is always the so called cell line development. So the people give us amino acid sequence. We translate that into a gene, integrate the gene into our NUMA switch platform. Um, we take out the first feasibility study uh, data, so how good does it work, which switch check protein, so we have different switch check proteins nowadays, is, nowadays, is the best one. Um, then we use the right cell line to produce a milligram sample, and this only lasts a month. Mm -hmm. So within one month, the people get, this, uh, get the information of the cell line and the milligram sample, being in the same schedule as I mentioned as chemical synthesis, which is very important for peptides. So this is the wor first work package, cell line development program. And then we ship a milligram sample um, and the people use that to check for uh, purity, identity, are doing some functional assays with a small sample. And if this is done, then we start our second development program. We call that process development program. So we, we scale up the pr production process um, to the gram scales, multi-gram scale and um, develop all the analytics needed. We optimize the process in terms of TIDAS, uh, we do all the things people want, right? Some people want to get the products in their hands very quickly, then we don't take con uh, uh, um, consider the development of the pro overall process so much. We just, you know, do the material for the studies. Or other people, especially in non-farm environments where we are also active, um, they are interested in a very efficient process. So we have a detailed look on the process. How do we increase the titers? Um, get a scalable production process into our hands, um, very cost efficient with, you know, uh, kind of cheap chromatographic steps. So we, we do a process development program, meeting the demands of the clients in terms of time, quality, and um, scalability. And this lasts then two months, roughly. Then the, it's also, I believe, very quick. Um, because we have such a strong platform, we, we don't need to adjust so much things. Um, the downstreaming, of course, needs to meet the personality of the target, yeah, because, you know, um, peptides and proteins, they don't accept, all of them don't accept the same stuff, right? Um, pH values, salts, uh, chromatographic accessibility. So we work on that. But overall, we have a really strong platform. We only need to adapt things. So within two months, this uh, gram scale processes are set. Again, it's not quicker than chemical synthesis for peptides, right? It's comparable, I would say. Um, so we are not quicker than chemical synthesis for peptides. Um, but comparable for peptides and proteins, we make a big difference in terms of timing because if you have a long chain peptide or a small protein, you need to work nowadays with recombinant systems. And then people normally, uh, when we talk to them and we tell them we use E. coli, and they say, oh, I don't want to get my milligram sample in six or nine months, and I don't want to have the process uh, set in two years, we go to chemical synthesis again, even for peptides. So even for peptides, 60 amino acids, 80 amino acids, I would say the majority of people go to chemical synthesis. And then we take over once these pro <laughs> projects, because if you go to phase one or phase two, you cannot meet the, the purity grades anymore that are requested by FDA. So 95% by chemical synthesis of a 60 or 80 more is, is quite tough, right? And you also need to consider, of course, the cost of goods. So you don't want to do six HPLC purification steps or so. So that's really tough, but still the people go there. 
Um, with our service, as I mentioned, even the gram scale process development only lasts two months. We can then use, um, after a three month period, period, period is done, we can use it to produce up to 100 gram, as I mentioned. And everything except exceeding this scale and also GMP materials, et cetera, we are doing them with our toll manufacturing partner network. Um, so we have set, um, settled a strong partner network that can do the GMP manufacturing or manufacturing um, at large scale. And even the release of GMP material with this partner network uh, can be performed within nine months, which again is comparable to chemical synthesis for peptides, but it's really quick for peptides and proteins compared to alternatives. So it's really speedy what we do. We have three development um, programs, as I mentioned, cell and development, process development, and then the manufacturing at scale. So I guess, Elaine, maybe you could talk a little bit about that timeline. So the the comparable um times for doing chemical synthesis and then uh, and then i'll have a follow-up question <laughs> yeah the, the, the timelines uh uh are comparable as uh christian was was mentioning for what they are offering in the firm now what is not comparable actually is the idea that when you are uh looking at these long sequences of uh, more than 50 and, and 60 uh, amino acids uh, yes, there are chemical manufacturers that are uh, accepting to go <laughs> uh, and, and, and uh, you know, get to this high level of, um, of demand, I would say. I say high level of demand because uh, you must realize that manufacturing those, uh, after all, uh, when process development is needed and validation and, and, and commercialization will be needed, you really have a tough moment uh, as, as a chemist when facing uh, the, the big challenge of the assembly uh, and, and all what is uh, all about the consequences. The consequences are that the purity, although uh, the, the analytical tools nowadays are performing, uh, performing sorry, and uh, are showing the purity level uh, of what you could reach, it's still a high challenge uh, for a chemist because the analytical tools will develop and will further and further show you what is behind this famous peak, <laughs> I would say an HPLC peak or whatever that is behind the, the, uh, the, the mixture uh, that is still existing because the complexity is very high when you're reaching these, these high long sequences. And, and of course, I don't have to make all the technical matters around here, uh, but you know, all what is happening during a, a type of solid phase synthesis or even liquid phase synthesis, and the number of the huge number of impurities that you are reaching with these long sequences. So overall, we say that it might be the same timing, I'm not sure, because the process development is getting tougher and tougher with these longer sequences for the peptide chemists. I would say. Uh, so uh, when I looked at uh, the this offering of uh, a hundred or a eighty amino acids really long, with the same time that is required for developing a ten to twenty amino acids really long, I, I, I'm really astonished. I would say, uh, and, and pleased to know that there will be this opportunity for. Uh, you know the, the the clients who are developing this kind of works to really reach uh, faster uh, their uh, their clinical development and and, and clinical success, I would say, hopefully. Right, and so I think yeah, some of the benefits that that both you and Christian have brought up, so speed, access to the longer molecules, sustainability, um, but also. You're not just stuck to the standard um, proteinogenic amino acids, right? You can do some modifications um, with the, the system. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit? Yes, um, we can do that quite something nowadays. Um, but before I jump into more details, of course, it's not like chemical synthesis. Chemical synthesis has big advantages in these aspects because you only take out the amino acid you want to integrate out of the shelf. And you can add more or less everything in the peptide chain if you want. Um, so we are not at this stage. And I don't think that we will be at this stage in the next 10 years or so, because um, synthetic bio biology is not that far. 
Um, but we can do something. So uh, since we started our company as peptide company, a lot of projects didn't happen because of the presence of maybe a single non-natural amino acid already, yeah, which is tough. Um, so we have developed protocols to handle that. And nowadays we are in the position that we can do C-terminal amidation reactions, for example, N-terminal acetylation reactions. We also um, uh, have um, protocols in place now to do click chemistry to add uh, um, fatty acid, uh, acids to side, uh, side change, for example, and a very promising approach called amber stop codon strategy. Um, it's a recombinant stuff where you can include already non-natural amino acids during the fermentation, not arbitrary ones, right? Specific ones. Um, it's very promising and we also are able to use this approach to include non-natural amino acids, as I mentioned, during fermentation. You can also optimize this approach so you need to evolve things. It's not easy, right? You need to do something, but then you can do that in principle, not for all amino acids, but for quite some amino acids. So we are working more and more on that and want to expand our capacity. Um, we have a lot of things nowadays, but to be very frank, it's not like chemical synthesis. We just take out what we need. There's still There are still limitations and we always judge based on the signals we got from our client, whether this is likely to work or not. Great. I mean, at, at, like you said, there's, this sounds like a complementary system to all of the other systems out there. So it's complementary to synthesis, to chemical synthesis, um, and, and even to what others, you know, CDMOs are doing in their production. So, yeah, it's not, it's not like it has to be a one-size-fit-all to be in it, you know, a useful and novel technology. No, we would no, have to. Uh, sorry, Allah. Sorry, 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 sorry about that. Uh, we don't have to forget one of the main advantages, of course, uh, as usual, uh, between the uh, biological manufacturing and chemical manufacturing is the waste uh, uh, treatment, of course, of, of what uh, these chemical manufacturing are unfortunately bringing a lot. Uh, still, uh, there are a lot of efforts that are, are produced uh, by, by the CDMOs and, and or, or, or any other manufacturer uh, for to really uh, lower the uh, these amounts, but they, they will stay there for a time. Uh, it's it's tough because, as usual, I mean, uh, would what type of technology would you use? Liquid phase, solid phase, whatever. Uh, you will always face the same issue. And the arch chemistry as well, and the arch, arch uh, uh, chemical regions that are part of it. So all that, of course, is uh, not there. Uh, in, in in that in that offering, but of course, again, in this complementary com complementary segment of the business, of course. Right, absolutely. What well, was there anything that I didn't touch on that you wanted to talk about? Um, is it okay, so, you so I I would be interested in having you as experts in the round. Um, I. I read about um, the ban of BMF, for example, yeah, be, be happening, I believe, in this year, for example. I think there will be extensions for the peptide chemical synthesis industry because, you know, it wouldn't work otherwise we need the peptides, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, but um, how, what implication do you see here? Is it just, you know, you have a rule that is then just not um, um, uh, um, happening in this industry? Or do you think that DMF will be banned in new developments uh, from now on, or, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, they, they are uh, nowadays trying, as I was mentioning, they're doing a lot of efforts to try to diminish the, this uh, burden, I would say, with uh, changing. You, you mentioned here DMF, the dimethylformamide, which is nowadays replaced by different uh, other solvents in the specifically in the solid phase manufacturing. Uh, there are a lot of efforts, of course, and also the um, chemoenzymatic uh, approach as well is, is something that is uh, you know, towards you know, improving uh, all these things. But again, it, it remains chemistry uh, as usual. And uh, I think this, this world will have to change anyway, and accepting the fact that uh, there might be other uh, ways of manufacturing, like combining, for instance, the uh, biological manufacturing together with what the chemistry can afford, uh, like fragments, coupling, and all these. This, go this is going to be the case. Uh, people are developing, you know, um, uh, complex uh, uh, ligation, uh, 
uh, even some people are working with coupling in water for these, these different things are coming. So there will be a nice effort made by the uh, all the players in, in the chemistry uh, manufacturing, the chemical manufacturing. But uh, I would better see uh, these uh, these two coming together uh, with the idea of uh, mixing uh, the uh, the neat uh, uh, biological manufacturing uh, together with still uh, something that is uh, weighing weighing a burden, but but lowering it substantial and this will be uh, the opportunity for still uh, that peptide uh, you know, drug industry to, to go further and further because it's very helpful of course as you can imagine nowadays you see uh, what type of treatment and they go to all type of uh, uh, treatment of illnesses uh, in many many cases and then there are big efforts that are made in the cancer or you know, the main or big effort that made in the metabolism, obesity, and di diabetes, and so on. So we cannot lose this, of course, but we have really, to, as manufacturers, really to think about a new way of, uh, I agree with you, a new way of, of working together. Thanks a lot. So I guess the one thing I always ask people um, is just to sort of think about, like, the next five years, what you're most hopeful for to see. Um, so maybe, uh, uh, Alain, you're actually, and I'm sorry, I'm probably saying your name wrong. Is it Alain or Elaine? Uh, well, you can say whatever. Never. <laughs> Alain, but, but you cannot say that yeah. in, in English. That's no way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're currently on my speaker view, so why don't you start with what you're most hopeful for in the next sort of five years? Uh, uh, you, mean, you mean what? In the field. Are you of talking about the, the overall picture of, of the drug? Uh, of, yeah, in general, of, of this technology, of what you see happening with peptides and, and peptides, oh, yeah. and yeah, how? Well, as I said, it's moving. You, you, you would look at the portfolio uh, of clinical development nowadays, it's, it's quite huge. Uh, it, well, there is a mix you know, of uh, market studies that can be made, of course, and then you turn towards what is preclinical, but then when you look, look at preclinical, you have a huge tunnel of things that are happening there uh it's and the number of these that will go into clinical of course will be as usual restricted but but the number is growing and growing further and further and only analyzing uh on a helicopter view on what uh, are the, uh, the commercial you know projections i would say uh, it, it's uh, nowadays we are at 30 billion uh, US dollar sales of uh, peptide drugs, and they are looking at 45 in, in four to five years' time uh, due to the, uh, you know, the, the nice, uh, um, sorry, the nice uh, progresses that are made in, in the different areas. And, you know, it's always jump by jump. Uh, in the past, it was the cancer, the cancer uh, drugs that were really uh, booming uh, in terms of peptide uh, approach, and nowadays it's metabolism with obesity and diabetes, and there will be another one because there are a lot of efforts that you know, are done in other areas, the cardiovascular and uh, and vaccines as well. So it's growing, growing, growing. Uh, in, uh, again, with the two uh, two types of approach, this chemistry and the the bio, uh, the biological needs we will make it uh, more even affordable to uh, to everyone uh, to look at these uh, different potential uh, therapeutic potential of course so by by far it's it's, uh, it's it can be optimistic in what can be the demand uh, further demand in this area and again thanks to the technology that are evolving in both ways Christian how about you yeah, yeah, first of all, I hope that in five years, our law is still as much engaged in the chemical synthesis and peptide industry as he is nowadays. So, <laughs> great. Um, secondly, um, I, I think um, really a major milestone for me personally and as company would be that we see the first product um, commercially available being produced by our technology, of course, in the pharma field it last 10 to 12 years or so when to, to to go over phase one to the commercial phase so it lasts but within five years i hope there will be the first ones um 
also, I hope that we are as company growing further and further. So we, we really have a good growing at the moment. We are 30 people and I hope in five years we, we have grown much um, in terms of people, but also in terms of our offerings that we can offer. So, of course, it would be very elegant to produce also in-house uh, under GMP at large scale. So this is uh, something that I would love to see in five years and maybe on a top level. Um, I believe peptides, they are up to 40 amino acids, fairly established on the market, um, as well as proteins are, right? Um, and it would be nice if in the next five years, the next wave of establishing peptides is, is starting so that people know that peptides get accessible um, um, with our process or other processes because they are really underrepresented and there is a lot of ongoing already now by developing more and more complex long chain peptides, which we call peptides. So it would be great if this wave continues and peptides are really a class of molecules um, that are established or start to get established in the next five years. Awesome. Good mm -hmm. thing to be helpful for. All right. Well, if you can believe it, it's been an hour. So um, I will <laughs> thank you both very much for your time and for uh, the discussion. Thank you, Wendy, for organizing so well. Thank you. Wendy, thanks a lot. It's really a pleasure to, a pleasure to be in contact with you. It's, uh, it's cool. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward also to uh, see you then in person again. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Exploration Science. For additional details on the topic, please see the description box for links to articles and other resources. If you enjoyed the interview, please like, share, and subscribe. As always, we welcome your feedback and suggestions, which you can leave in the comments section. Thanks again for tuning in.